Find a Bible and join me if you would in the Gospel of John. We're going to be in the fourth chapter this morning, Gospel of John chapter 4. It's kind of important that you follow along and, and uh, look in your Bible and know that this is coming from Him. Uh, we're going to begin with reading a, a good part of chapter 4 and then we're going to unpack a bit of it and then see how it applies to us and what God would be telling us. Join me, if you would, in Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the, or when Jesus learned the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. How can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place which must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Skip with me, if you would, down to verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of town and made their way towards him. Join me down in verse 39. 
Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. Because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this man is really the Savior of the world. What an amazing story. Before we unpack it, let's ask God's help and blessing. Would you bow with me? God, <clears throat> help us to understand what you were doing and saying to this woman. And Father, help us to, as we understand it, to apply it in our lives because we know you've saved this for us. You've given us this beautiful story to shape our minds and our hearts to be better the people you want us to be. Bless us in this, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, this is, a, this is a story that follows on the heels of the story last week. And by the way, thank you for letting me preach again. I, I never quite get over that. I'm, I'm just, I really enjoy doing it. So thanks for letting me continue to do that. Last week we had Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Pharisees are model citizens. They're people that want to project what God wants so that everybody else can see it and know what to imitate. And yet, a Pharisee needs to begin again. He needs to start over. He needs to have new birth, a water spirit birth from above. And he needs to be changed in that way and have a new beginning. There's none of us. None of us who are so right with God and so pure in our lives that we don't need to start over. That's something we all need. On the other hand, we, we, Nicodemus is that guy that, that just is so good and so perfect and so well connected that surely he doesn't need that, and he does. And now we have a woman that is so broken and so foreign and so outside the people of God that how could she possibly have any connection with God? A guy too good to be believed and a guy, a woman so far away she could never come back. And by the way, if you think John's not thinking about new birth that we experience in the waters of baptism, verse 22 of chapter 3, after this Jesus and disciples went out into the Judean countryside and spent some time with them and baptized. John was baptizing near an end, and the conversation goes on about baptism. And where do we begin chapter 4? We began chapter 4 with the Pharisees hearing that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples. Reading baptism into that new birth of water spirit birth, in John 3, is not reading something into John that's not there. It's what's on John's mind as he tells these stories to bring people to Jesus. In this story, they're traveling, and it says he had to go through Samaria. Now, look at a map. You've got Galilee up here in the north. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do this backwards. Ted Kelly could used to do it backwards, and I never understood that. i got to be over here. Okay, Galilee's up here in the north. Mediterranean's to the west. Jordan River runs down between Galilee and the Dead Sea. And, and on the west side of that river is Judea in the south. That's where Jerusalem is. And right in the middle between Galilee and and Judea is Samaria. And it says he had to go through Samaria. But in Jesus' days, there are Jews who are so yucked out by the possibility of catching, I guess, Samaritan cooties that they, they won't go through the land. Instead, they'd rather cross the Jordan into Gentile territory, full-on outright pagan land, and go up and then cross over into Galilee. Or if they're in Galilee, cross over and go down and come back. Jesus didn't have to. In fact, Jesus chose to go through Samaria. 
He's on a journey and he's tired and he sits down by a well. It's about noon. Any of y'all want to sit down at noon? Okay, show hands, okay? Y'all looking at me like a monkey looking at a math problem. It's not hard. You like to sit down at noon. You like to get some shade, okay? I grew up here, and I, th I thought it was hot in Abilene. I forgot all about this humidity thing y'all have here. I've lived where we don't ever have it. You know, when we do, it scares the children. Um, <laughs> it's hot here. Well, the, the Texas is a fairly good weather kind of, uh, it's a lot like Galilee and, and Judea. And so sitting down in the middle of the day, I don't know if he found a good rock to sit on. I, I picture him back in the, the, the shade of some kind of tree or bush, leaning back against something. He's walked a long way. He's tired. His disciples are going to go get some food, and he's waiting at the well. But our Savior's actually waiting for some person to come. He knows she's coming. And along comes a woman. She's a Samaritan woman. She came to draw water. Commentators remind us that, that women went to draw water early in the morning, late in the evening. They travel in the cool. They're carrying a, a, a jar full of water, which is heavy. Uh, they're going to have to you know, let the rope down and get the water and pull it back up, and there's going to be a lot of work involved. Do that early in the morning, late in the evening when it's cooler and better. She's coming in the middle of the day. She's by herself. She's not in, she's not in that group. Okay, I'm not trying to, to be rude or anything, but women do things in groups, and going to the well was one of the things they did in groups, but not this one. She's by herself. She's a Samaritan. And Jesus asked her for a drink. I want you to make a little list in your mind of the people you will take their drink from them and drink. Your parents of small children, you know what that means. You're going to get backwash, okay? There's going to be a little bit of Cheerios in whatever that is you're drinking, all right? You know, if you're at McDonald's, it's not just their drink. You're going to get some Happy Meal along with it. If someone takes your drink, do you want the drink back? I'm guessing most of you know, you know. Some of y'all probably happily give away your Yeti cup just to not have to think about drinking after them. Do you remember racially segregated water fountains? Jesus just asked, asked a Samaritan woman for a drink. Most Jewish rabbis, if they were sitting at that well, when a Samaritan woman approached the well, would have turned their back and ignored her and acted like she's not there until she was gone. All women are dangerous for Jewish rabbis. There's a natural cycle of impurity that occurs in their life. You can't sit on what they sit on. You can't touch them. You become unclean. And the Samaritan woman is worse. Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day declared that little girls born Samaritan are menstruants from birth. They are always and forever unclean. And Jesus doesn't just say, good day. He says, I want to drink from your jar. I want to put my mouth on what you had your mouth on. And I want to drink. This is amazing fellowship that he's requesting. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman, how can you ask, for me, ask me for a drink? I don't know what she thought he was up to. 
something's not socially correct. This isn't how it's done. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There's this animosity between them. Every time there's bigotry, there's always superior attitudes on both sides of it. That's how you become bigoted against someone. Samaritans thought, we didn't go into captivity like y'all did. We got to stay in the land when your ancestors went to Babylon. Your temple got torn down. We built one where God had always wanted it. And when y'all came back, you had the arrogance to come down here and destroy our temple. We were faithful to God all along, obviously, because he didn't send us to Babylon. Jews say, well, wait a minute. God told Solomon to build the temple in Jerusalem. And we have the king and the promises, and y'all won't even recognize the whole Bible. Samaritans only have the first five books. That's it for them. So all the promises about a son of David sitting on his throne forever, all the talk about Jerusalem being where his house is, it's not in their Bible. Jews feel superior because they've got the accurate, complete Bible, and, and Samaritans don't. I'm a Samaritan woman. Talking to me is not doing it right. Drinking after me is not doing it right. And Jesus said, if you actually knew the gift of God and who's asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Jesus doesn't just want to drink. Jesus wants to share himself with her. He wants to be her savior. He's going to have the same problem he had with Nicodemus. With Nicodemus, he's, he, he's trying to talk about a new birth, and he thinks, crawl back into my mom and be born again? I'm a little large for that. I'm a little old for that. That's not possible. And Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about spiritual things, about heavenly things, and you can't get your mind off of earthly things. And again, he's trying to teach a spiritual lesson, and she's caught in earthly things. I'd give you living water. She's looking at him going, okay, you don't have a rope. You don't have a bucket. The well's deep. Where are you going to get water? Much less living water. Where are you going to get this stuff? What, what kind of game are you playing with me? And Jesus says in verse 13, you drink this water, you're going to be thirsty again. But the water I give you is going to bubble up to eternal life. What I'm offering you is a source of life. John told us at the beginning, the Word became flesh. That Word came bringing light and life. People walking around thinking they're alive with no relationship to their Creator need the Word. They need Jesus to be connected to God, to be truly alive. He's offering this woman life from Him, life that bubbles up like a spring and fills her with life. She says, well, are you, you greater than our, our uh, ancestor? This is his well. This is Jacob's well. Well, of course he's greater. He was before Jacob. Before Abraham was, Jesus is going to say in this very gospel, I am. He's greater. He can give this bubbling, welling up eternal life. The woman whose mind is still caught in this world says, Oh, I want this water because I don't like coming to the well. This is a long walk and it's, it's embarrassing having to come by myself and I don't like this, so yes, I want that water. And Jesus says, Well, go call your husband. Oh, no. Oh, no. The last thing she wants to talk about is her marriage life. 
That's a dark secret she doesn't want revealed to this Jewish person who's asking her for a drink. Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day said, you know, um, e- even, even if it's death that happens, three's the limit. You know, after three, something's wrong with you. Okay? She doesn't have three. She had five. She's got one more. She's given up on the concept of marriage. She didn't want to talk about that. She didn't want to get into it. But Jesus knows already. Jesus already knew. He brings it up for a purpose, for a reason. Because he wants her to know, I know all about you. I know everything about you. And I want to give you living water. And I want you in fellowship with me. I want to drink from your vessel. I want to give you eternal life. And I want to be your savior. No matter what has happened in your life. She wants to change the subject. Oh, you know about my, all these husbands and you know about this guy I'm living with? You've got to be a prophet because there's no other way you would know this. But there's that question that Jews and Samaritans always argue about. Y'all know those questions? Y'all know those questions? You know, if you put someone from the Church of Christ and a Baptist in the room, you know what they're going to argue about, right? You put someone, you know, a, a Catholic in a Church of Christ, for you know what they're going to argue about. You know, it's all the same questions. So she asked the question that Jews and Samaritans always argue about, and it's a religious thing and has not a lot to do with her, so we can talk about it. It's kind of safe. Where are we supposed to worship? And her question is, where on this earth do we worship? And Jesus is trying to change people's thoughts about God because God is a spirit, and his kingdom is not of this world. The throne of his kingdom is in heaven. And what God wants is not us in a specific place. He wants our hearts and our spirits in line with him. And so he tells her, it's not the where, it's the how. How is in spirit and in truth. She likes what he's saying. He answered her question well. She's more and more impressed. Samaritans, by the way, are looking for a teacher, a prophet to come. Moses said in the Pentateuch that there will be a prophet like me coming. They're expecting that. But she doesn't use the Samaritan word. In verse 25, she uses the Jewish word. When the Messiah, when the anointed Savior comes, he'll tell us everything. Please look in your Bible in verse 26. It is one of the most rare things imaginable. Jesus is never this direct with the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Chief priests who are supposed to be teaching people about Yahweh and how to serve him. Pharisees who are leading in the synagogues teaching and helping people know the law and what God wants of them and what the prophets said. He's never this direct with them. But with a five-time divorced Samaritan woman at a well, just the two of them, he says, I am he. I'm the Messiah. He's never that direct with those others, but with her he is. How is that possible? Maybe because those Jewish leaders are always saying, Jesus, would you show us a sign to prove you have the authority to do this? And she's not. She's open to his teaching. And she's ready to hear it. And so she runs into town, leaves her jar. You know, what she came for, you know, leave the whole basket at Walmart. I'm going to go to town. i got something to tell people. This is too important. 
She runs in and she tells them, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. I'm suspecting there are at least six men in town that are very interested in meeting this guy. And a whole crowd follows. At the same time, Jesus' disciples have been in that same town buying food. Nobody follows them back to Jesus. When Jesus gets through teaching them and, and telling them things, more of them become believers. And they say, we're not believing just because of what you said. Now we're believing because of what we've heard for ourselves. It's a beautiful, wonderful story. Here's a few things I think it's saying to us today. And the first one is, if you know Jesus is the Savior, if you know he's the Son of God, you know enough to call people to meet him. That's all you have to know. The Cana of Galilee School of Preaching went into town to buy food. Twelve little student preachers come into town. Nobody follows them back. And the last person in the whole country that you would think could convert people to Jesus Christ converts the whole town. How's that possible? Let me explain. I'm at a gathering. There's eight, eight guys there who are about to play golf, people introducing themselves. And what do you do? Well, I, I, I sell compressors for the oil field. You know, that's great and everything. And I'm over there just sweating bullets because I know somebody's going to ask me what I do. And when they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a preacher. They all try to maintain that, that neutral facial expression. But you can see their eyes rolling into the top of their head. Well, there goes the day. <laughs> Y'all are sweet. Y'all sit here and listen to me every week. Yay! Thank you. Again, thank you. A lot of your friends don't want to meet the preacher, okay? I mean, they're going, I can't even tell that joke. The preacher's here, you know. You have more influence on them than I ever will. I would love to talk about Jesus with anybody you know. This building itself, well, it, it would be intimidating if it had a sign that says Church of Christ, but we need a sign, okay? <laughs> but a church building is intimidating. But they know you, and you know Jesus, and you need to tell them, I found the best thing ever, and ask them to come with you. And if you don't have friends that are coming with you, you need to be here and smile at everybody else's friends and love on them and let them know we've found the Messiah we found the one who bought us from sin and bought us from hell, covered our sin with his blood, gave us a new relationship with God, reconciled us to him. We need to let them know that we found him. He'll sell himself. He's good at that. But invite them. Tell them what you found. Have them come. The story also speaks to a dark side of human nature and of our culture. Racial prejudice has no place at all among the people of God. There's very few things that make me want to punch somebody. That one does. About 15 years ago, we had someone make some horrible racial remarks at church, and I preached about it. And I told the elders, I said, I, 
really, I didn't want to preach about it. I just wanted to hit him. And they said, well, you could always do that later. <laughs> and I'm thinking, look at that. Shepherd's telling me I can hit somebody. Okay. People, you can't be that and be a child of God. If that's in your heart, you need to repent. Amen. Our Savior is not that. He sees every human being made in his image. Every one of us. All of us. All the time. And a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan woman. A Samaritan woman with a dark past she'd like to hide. And Jesus wants her. If you understand the history and the culture and the nature of that relationship between Jews and Samaritans, then you know John is telling us there is no one outside of God's calling. No one. Oh, but you don't know what I did. You don't know my past. Jesus knew her past and waited on her and sat there by the well while everybody he knew left. And when she came, he said, can I have a drink? And he keeps talking to her about these great spiritual things because he wants her to be in fellowship with him. He wants his death to cover all the bad choices she's made. And you know what we do? We give up on that great choice. We give up on that Savior because I'm not good enough. Of course you're not good enough. None of us are good enough. And so we go somewhere else and we try to fill a void that's in our life that's meant to be God. We're meant to drink from that well. We're meant for it to bubble up and destroy a thirst for some things. And we try to drink from other wells to satisfy us. And they won't work. She goes from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage trying to fill a void that only God can fill. And we go from possession to possession to possession trying to fill a hole in our lives and our hearts that's meant to be God because we're created to be in fellowship with Him. Nothing else will do it. No accomplishment is great enough to fill the void that your Creator is supposed to be to you. And nothing you've done, nothing you've done is dark and ugly enough. No matter how secret it is, no matter how embarrassing it would be, if everyone in this room found out, Jesus still wants you. And his people who love him and have his heart want you to. If it's dark and ugly, come to Jesus. Drink from him. Let him be living water for you. Let him be your savior and make you a child of God. Pray with me one more time. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving that woman so long ago, so much. And Father, help us to learn from her that you want us, no matter how ugly, no matter how rebellious we've been, you want us. Father, that love is, is great and even knowing it's true, it's hard for us to imagine. But Father, help us to know it's true. And help us to rely on you. Restore our fellowship with you through Jesus. And to drink deeply of that spring that wells to eternal life. We pray this in his name. Amen.